All right, let's continue on with our discussion of the second law of thermodynamics. So at this, up to this point, we've established that the statement that uh, spontaneity, hot to cold, is a one uh, explanation of the second law. That is connected with the idea of going from ordered to disordered state, which is ultimately a probabilistic aspect. And we introduced the concept of en entropy as an indirect way of measuring that. And then I talked about the very end, this extremely important concept that the amount of energy in the universe is not increasing or decreasing, but the amount of useful energy is steadily decreasing. And that's ultimately the fate of the universe is what's called this heat death in that all the ordered energy that's out there, gravitational potential energy, really that's what a star has, okay, all that ordered energy is allowing fusion to occur, and then when that fusion occurs and it gives off the kinetic energy of those, let's say, neutrons, which ultimately can give us radiation, um, that becomes more disordered. Um, even but that energy input from the sun can create ordered energy on Earth, that's all the fossil fuels, it is the impetus for creating organization that ultimately led to life. But as those living processes go on, or as we burn the energy or use it, the amount of order in the universe ultimately increases. Okay, And so we want to at least understand that on some basis. And that leads us really to the final statement. This is perhaps the most important statement of the second law of thermodynamics. Thou shalt not decrease the total entropy of thy universe for any natural process. So we've got to be really careful of how to interpret that statement. It's the total entropy of the universe. So you can have parts of the universe where the entropy is decreasing, but if you look, expand the system, there is, if you look at the whole process, even though you have a small part where delta S is negative, if you look at the environment, the delta S that goes there is more positive. And so the overall result is going to be positive. Okay? So that's what I was saying. You can have a local decrease of entropy, especially within, uh, if the import, and you can do this, especially with the input of ordered energy. Okay? So when you have ordered energy, you can decrease the local entropy. All right? However, the overall entropy of the universe still has to increase, as we'll see in a minute. And this is the reason why biological processes, which are highly ordered, do not violate this law. So within an organism, let's say a cell, let's say a cellular object, an amoeba, it's highly organized and the entropy is constantly de decreasing, but it's, in, it's happening because you have an input of energy that's ordered. And so if you look as, as it, it excretes it as it's, um, ex, I don't want to say exhales, but if you look at the biological processes where it has to get rid of waste and waste energy, and you look at the energy change of that, that's much higher than any loss of entropy you have by carrying out its regular biological processes. So hopefully that kind of makes sense. All right, so let's look at some examples in a few minutes here. I'm not going to do them all. I'm going to ask you to try to do some on your own. Um, but this is, I think, very abstract. So an inventor approaches you with a device that claims you can take 100 joules of th internal energy and produce 200 joules of electrical energy. Why does this device violate the first and second law of thermodynamics? Okay, so I think the first one is uh, easy. For the first law, why there's a violation, and that's simply we get more out than we put in, right? Sorry. In other words, our output is the 200 joules, that's the uh, electrical energy, and we're only inputting 100 joules. So that's pretty straight, uh, straightforward. Why is there a second law of violation? All right, so you've got to go back and look at some of these statements. And in terms of when we have numbers like here, you might look, try to calculate entropy or something like that, but you're not giving any temperature. But you can look at efficiency. And so we're going to often see in these problems uh, a violation in efficiency. Remember, there's a Carnot efficiency. But if you look at simply our efficiency here, right, by definition, which is Q over W, right, what is our Q input? Well, it's, well we're going to assume the internal energy was uh, 100. Uh, I'm sorry, I've got that backwards. Oops. It's not Q over W, it's W over Q. So we have... Uh, 200 over 100, which is greater than 1, which you can't have, okay? In fact, we're going to see later on, it can't even be greater than, I don't, I don't know how to put that, it cannot be greater than the Carnot efficiency. So it, it, 
even if we had an efficiency of 0.8, if that's greater than a Carnot efficiency, that's a violation of the second law. Okay, so keep that in mind. So why does a refrigerator not violate the second law of thermodynamics? Well, let's draw our refrigerator. So let's say it's just some little compartment, someplace isolating. We have an energy input. Okay, that could be come from, uh, let's say, a voltage source, right? That's a, we, have, we plug it in. And then what's happening in there? We don't need to know the engineering there, but what we have is we, we have Q flow from cold to warm right? We're dumping uh, energy, internal energy via heat flow uh, to here. So why does this not violate? Well, if we look at the delta S um, in the cold part, right, that's going to be, let's just say, uh, let's, I'm going to make up a number, negative 100 uh, kilojoules per Kelvin, okay? But if we look at the delta S in the warm part, right, the entropy, so we're, we're dumping heat into here, and if we calculate the entropy there, we're going to see that that's, let's say, positive 200, okay? I, I want to say that this is bigger than this, but by, by definition is because positive is always bigger than negative. So maybe the better way to put it is the gain in entropy in the hot part of the environment is always bigger than the loss of energy in the cold department. So the net change in entropy of the whole environment, the universe, is greater than zero. It's a decrease in entropy here because we're inputting ordered energy. So that's not a problem as long as we look more universally at the overall change in entropy of the system. Okay, so let's do another numerical example. We got half a kilogram of water at freezing point solidifies into ice at the same temperature, calculate the change in entropy of the water. So here, since we have a phase change, we can use the uh, equation Q over T, okay? And so here we're not looking for the entire universe, we're just looking for the entropy of the water. So that's going to be equal to the heat flowing in. Now, since we are freezing water, heat has got to flow out of the system, so this is going to be a negative. And it's going to be negative M of the amount that we're freezing times the latent heat of fusion and occurring at the temperature uh, of the freezing point. Okay, so the, again, the subtle thing here is why this is negative. But again, the Q can be positive or negative whether there's heat flowing in or out. And since, again, um, we are changing water into ice, we're going from more ordered or less, less ordered to more ordered, right? Well, ice is more ordered than that, so we expect the entropy change to be negative. And that's another way you can look at that. So if we put in numbers and we get that, we'll get a negative 610 joules per Kelvin, okay, where the heat of latent late heat diffusion is that. So the key thing here is, A, we get a negative, which is consistent with the idea of going from, right, random, more random water molecules to, if you will, and crystals, okay? So why doesn't that violate the law of second law of thermodynamics for the same reason that we have uh, with the refrigerator, okay? So in an IB question, this would be, you know, although, right, we have a negative delta S, a, a loss in entropy for, from or for water to ice, right? And again, why did that happen? We had some ordered energy input in that refrigeration system. Okay, second point, there is a greater positive change in S because um, thermal energy, I'm just going to call it thermal E, is extracted from the fridge and dumped into the surroundings. Okay, so calculate the entropy of that aspect, which we did not do above, we'd see that we'd get a bit, we would get a bigger value than what we got for the loss in entropy of simply freezing the ice. Okay, so let me do one more here, and then I'll ask you to try the last of the problems on your own. So we'll go back to a PV diagram. Let me just check something here for a second. All right, I'm good on time. Okay, so we have a fixed ideal gas that's compressed from volume one, right, 
to volume two. So we have something like that. And the volume is going down, that's why it's a compression. And it's at constant temperature, so this is an isotherm. All right. Now, it says on the diagram, draw a line to show the variation in pressure as the volume of the gas is changed from V1 to V2. So the same thing, except there's no thermal energy allowed to enter or leave the gas. Okay, in other words, and this is how you interpret this, Q equals zero. And so when we see Q equals zero, we've got to think what process? That's right, adiabatic. Okay, so what does adiabatic mean? Well, adiabatic is simply go, we are changing temperature without their heat flow because there is work being done on or by the gas. So if we're starting here and we're compressing the gas, we should associate a compression of a gas adiabatically with an increase in temperature. So if this is, let's say, at 700 Kelvin, we want to increase that, we want to look at an isotherm that is, let's say, up here, 800 Kelvin, 900 Kelvin, whatever the case may be. So we want to go to a V2 that's at a higher temperature. So I'm starting here, and so I get something like that. So there's my adiabatic curve. Okay? I mean, you could probably draw a little better than I did there, but that's the idea. Now, for the compression of the gas at constant temperature, deduce what change, if any, occurs in the entropy of the gas and its surroundings. Okay, well, how about for the gas? We know that delta S, right, is going to equal Q over T. So, for the gas, what's happening to it? Well, we know that delta U is zero. No, it's not zero. I take that back. We know that Q is zero. Okay, so I just had to read this again. I was not, I assume this led to this, but this is at constant temperature. Okay, so constant temperature delta U is zero. Okay, I was about to say Q is zero, which would lead to no entropy change, but that's not the case. So constant temperature, so they're talking about the original one from here to here, not the adiabatic one. Okay, and, and don't forget that delta U is Q plus W. Oops, not delta. Let me rewrite that. So again, delta U is W done on the gas plus Q. Well, since we're compressing the gas, this is positive. And since the total is zero, then we know that this has to be negative. So delta S for the gas is going to be a negative Q over whatever T. It's at a constant temperature. So we have a negative change in entropy for a loss in entropy of the gas. Okay, So it's become more ordered, if you will. The surroundings, then, by the second law of thermodynamics, has to be a positive delta S, such that the total... Right total delta S is positive as well. So in other words, this value has to be bigger than the negative of this value. All right, I'll leave you to try the others on your own, um, and we'll talk about them in class.